Welcome everyone. My name is Laura Youngstrom and I'm the Adult Services Librarian for the Reddick Public Library District in Ottawa, Illinois. I am honored to host this special presentation this evening by photographic historian Mary Jane Apple as she presents on Ottawa, Illinois native Russell Lee and discusses topics featured in her new book, Russell Lee, A Photographer's Life and Legacy. Mary Jane Apple is based in Washington, DC and if any positive outcome has come out of this last year, it is definitely the exploration of offering more virtual events such as this to share information from across the country with each other. So some housekeeping for tonight. If you have any questions, please add them in the chat box and time will be allowed following the lecture for Mary Jane to answer the questions. This is a recorded presentation and it will be uploaded to the Reddick Library's YouTube channel in the upcoming days following this event. So thank you for your attention and now I will turn this evening over to Mary Jane Apple. Thank you, Laura, for having me here today. And thank you everyone for coming. I'm so excited to be here uh, because Ottawa is such an important part of my 20 year journey, researching and writing this book about Russell Lee and the photographs he made for the Farm Security Administration, Office of War Information, FSA, OWI, or just FSA for short. And I'd like to start with a few words about the FSA. The FSA was a government photography project that documented America during the Great Depression and early years of World War II. About 20 photographers worked for the FSA and between 1935 and 1943, they shot around 175,000 photographs. Now to give you just an idea of the size of 175,000 photographs. If we made eight by 10 prints of every image shot by these photographers and laid them end to end, they would stretch for 22 miles. These 175,000 photographs, which we now know as the FSA OWI collection, are in the Prints and Photographs Division at the Library of Congress here in Washington, DC. I first got interested in the FSA and in Russell Lee's work in particular in 1997, when I took a job right out of graduate school, working on a project to digitize the FSA OWI collection at the Library of Congress. Now, at that time, the collection was not available online as it is now. You could only view the collection if you came in person to the Prints and Photographs Division Reading Room. And even at that time, even then, you could only see the printed portion of the collection, about 77,000 file prints, like the one I'm showing you here on the right. And file prints were, and they still are, organized in rows of filing cabinets. And on the left, I'm showing you just one row of those cabinets. Now, I'd like to add here that the research photographs I'm showing you today, like these two, are not in the book. They are extra material just for this talk. So my job back in 1997 was to match file prints to negatives for the digitization project. I spent hundreds of hours at those file cabinets looking at thousands of file prints. And I studied the work of all the principal photographers, but Russell Lee's photographs really stood out to me. There were a few things about Russell Lee's work that immediately caught my eye. The first was that I was drawn to the way he photographed people. I saw a certain sensitivity, a sense of empathy in his portraits, like these two, both taken in Missouri. On the left, I'm showing you a former sharecropper being helped by the FSA and moving to a new farm. And here Lee pictured her on moving day in 1938. On the right is uh, Lee's portrait of a flood refugee displaced by the great Ohio River flood in 1937. And here Lee pictured her after she's taken shelter in a schoolhouse. 
Another aspect of Lee's work that caught my eye was his use of flash. And I'm showing you two early examples here, children of tenant farmers in Iowa in 1936. Now, most of the homes Lee visited did not have electricity. Often the rooms had no windows, and so Lee ended up using his flash to light the space. And on the left, I'm showing you one of Lee's more famous photographs of children eating a Christmas dinner of potatoes and cabbage. And on the right is a child sitting on an old bed in an attic room. Now I'd like to emphasize here that flash photographs of this era did not normally look like this. Flash usually highlighted only the foreground and left the background in darkness. But these photographs really highlighted, uh, for me, Lee's technical proficiency with flash. He's illuminated the entire space evenly, which gives us a depth of focus and really an incredible level of detail. These two photographs also highlighted for me another aspect about Lee's work. I noticed that he had a special gift for photographing children in distress. But what I really noticed back in 1997, what really pulled me in, was Lee's habit of documenting family photographs on display inside people's homes. And these are just two examples of dozens I came across. Sometimes Lee depicted family members with their portraits, as in the photograph on the left taken in Texas in 1939. Other times he documented only the portraits, such as this photograph taken in an Iowa farmhouse in 1936 on the right. I couldn't find much written about Lee in 1997, but I did learn a few things that really piqued my interest. I discovered that he was the most prolific FSA photographer with the longest tenure. And I also learned that he had a tragic childhood and was independently wealthy his entire adult life, which made me wonder, why would someone who was independently wealthy choose to become a government photographer, live out of their car to document the disadvantaged in America? And it, it was around this time that I also discovered Lee's photographs were appearing in popular culture but that he was rarely, if ever, credited. His photographs were well known, but he wasn't. For example, on the left, uh, I'm showing you tenant purchase clients at home taken in Texas in 1939, which was used in a Microsoft Windows screensaver. And on the right is Saturday Night in a Saloon taken in Minnesota in 1937. And it appeared in the opening credits of the television show Cheers, which by the late 1990s was in worldwide distribution. I wanted to know more, so I started to research Lee and his photographs. Lee had passed away more than a decade before I started my research, so one of the first things I did was to interview people who knew him. I started with his friends and colleagues who had worked with him in the 1930s and 40s, photographers and artists such as Louise Roscom, Bernarda Shawn, and Saul Lipson. And the people I spoke with were so happy to talk about him. They just, they conveyed their deep respect for him, told me how glad they were he was getting the attention he deserved. And I also spoke with people who knew him later in his life when he lived in Texas, including former Governor Ann Richards. And on the left, I'm showing you a few examples of my early interviews on cassette tape. And this now ancient technology really highlights just how long I've been working on this project. On the right is a snapshot I took uh, during one of my more unusual interviews with a group of Lee's friends from the 1970s and 80s in Austin, Texas. They took me on a tour of the barbecue places they used to visit with Lee on Friday afternoons. And I took this snapshot in um, Taylor, Texas at Louis Muller's. I traveled to a lot of other places that were important in Lee's story. 
I toured the campuses of the schools he attended, uh, Culver Military Academy in Culver, Indiana, where he spent his teen years, and Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where he studied chemical engineering. And on the right is a snapshot I took of the historic Linderman Library at Lehigh. And I also explored some of the places Lee photographed, including the site of his best known body of work in Pie Town, New Mexico. And on the left is a snapshot I took of my friend Elena photographing an abandoned house in that town. But the place where I spent the most time was in Ottawa, where Lee was born and where he spent his early life. I made three research trips to Ottawa between 2001 and 2015. And here I'm showing you just a handful of the places I visited. At the upper left is the Grand Victorian home at 1002 Ottawa Avenue, where Lee was born and lived as a young boy with his parents and grandparents. Lee's father left when he was about seven years old, and three years later, when Lee was 10, his mother was killed when she was hit by a car in front of him in downtown Ottawa, uh, right in front of the Clifton Hotel. The Clifton is no longer there, but I bought a postcard, which I'm showing you here in the center top row, and I went to the site of the Clifton Hotel at Columbus and Madison to try to piece together and envision just how the accident took place. I visited Russell Lee's family plot in the Ottawa Avenue Cemetery where his mother is buried. And at the top right uh, is a snapshot of the family marker. After Lee's mother was killed, he had five legal guardians by the time he turned 21, including his grandmother, Eva Warner, and his great uncle, Milton Pope, who many in Ottawa know today through the Milton Pope School. I also visited some of Lee's family farmland in LaSalle County, and here on the bottom row are two of those farms. In addition to visiting all of these geographic, loca uh, geographic locations, I met countless people in and around Ottawa who helped me uncover facts to understand more about Lee's life. I found documents related to Lee's family through the help of many people at multiple institutions, including Reddick Library, the LaSalle County Genealogy Guild, the LaSalle County Courthouse, the Office of Recorder of Deeds, and the county clerk's office, where I found, um, through the help of the staff, Lee's birth certificate, which I'm showing you here. I also found multiple documents through the generosity of several Ottawa area residents who shared both their time and their knowledge with me. And one of those individuals was longtime LaSalle County resident, Jerry Danielson. I met Jerry on one of my research trips to Ottawa, and we spent some time together there. Then he and I corresponded quite a bit uh, once I came back to Washington, D.C. And on the left, I'm showing you just one of Jerry's letters. Jerry took the time to answer my many questions about Illinois agriculture, what he knew about the many sources of Lee's income, and about farming families in LaSalle County including one of Lee's farm tenants from the 1930s. And on the right are just a few of the documents Jerry sent me with his notations. You can see them color coded there. Uh, maps of the farming sections, Milton Pope's will, and material related to the construction of the Milton Pope School. And in addition to Jerry, a few other LaSalle County residents were equally generous. Martin and Kathy. Kathy Meyer, who owned and operated one of the farms Lee inherited. Uh, they opened their home to me. And I have to say, one of the highlights of my two decades of research was riding on a 36 row planter with their daughter, Cara. Kathy, Kathy Meyer sent me multiple materials as well, including a book on the history of the Milton Pope School. 
And I'd also like to mention Betsy Feegans, uh, who managed the Core of Hope home before it closed a few years ago. Betsy gave me a tour of Milton and Cora Pope's home, which at the time I visited had remained largely unchanged uh, since Lee spent time there as a young man. Betsy also sent me a facsimile of Cora Pope's scrapbook of newspaper clippings, including many about her, um, about her nephew, Russell Lee. So as you can see, I had tremendous support from the Ottawa community in writing this book. In addition to my multiple trips to Ottawa, I also did a lot of research in libraries and archives across the country, including Albuquerque, New Mexico, San Marcos, Texas, Louisville, Kentucky, and Hyde Park, New York. But the bulk of my library and archives research I did here in Washington, DC at the Library of Congress. And along with the work I did in the prints and photographs division, I researched multiple collections in the manuscript division, geography and maps, newspapers and periodicals, rare books, microform, and general collections. And on the left, I'm showing you just one example of the research I did in general collections. Uh, this book truck is filled with the textbooks Lee studied as a chemical engineering student at Lehigh University. And I, I used them to look at how he learned methods of scientific observation in the 1920s and how he might have translated those to his photography in the 1930s. So with all of this primary source material, I created my own research and writing tools. And at the top right, I'm showing you a calendar of, that I made of every month Lee worked for the FSA OWI. And at the bottom right are enlargements from a 1930s road atlas where I mapped every assignment Lee photographed. Another part of my research involved Lee's relationship with the head of the documentary photography project, Roy Stryker, who hired Lee in 1936. And Stryker, who I'm showing you here on the left, was an economics instructor from Columbia University who came to Washington in 1935 to establish the documentary photography project we now know as the FSA. Stryker's official mission was to document the country's rural problems and the government's programs to address them, but he really envisioned something more than just recording the country's problems and solutions. What he really wanted to do was to create a photographic inventory of America, and Lee shared that vision with him. The two men conferred with one, with one another a lot, as you can see from the photograph on the right, and ultimately, they formed a symbiotic working relationship and a lifelong friendship. Lee worked for Stryker's project for six years, from the fall of 1936 to the fall of 1942. Lee photographed the social concerns of the era, including the country's agricultural problems, farm tenancy in the Midwest, sharecropping in the South, migration of farm workers to the West Coast. And he also pictured the country's ecological catastrophes. And I'm showing you three examples here. At the top left is an organ stranded in an Indiana cornfield carried there by the 1937 Ohio River flood. At the bottom left is cut over or deforested land in Michigan that was being sold as farmland. And at the right is a dust storm overtaking a farm in North Dakota. It's important to remember though, that at their core, Lee's photographs are always about people. The musician who once played that organ, the farmer who had no other choice but to try and salvage that cut over land, the owner of the barn and livestock, which was now engulfed in dust. Lee had a real gift for photographing people, as we saw in earlier slides, and he had a particular respect for skilled labor, so he often pictured his subjects at work. I'd also like to mention here that Lee, who was white, 
documented individuals from multiple racial and ethnic groups as part of his comprehensive record of American life. And here are just four examples. At the top left is an African-American worker at a cotton gin in Arkansas. At the top right is a Jewish American worker at a garment factory in New Jersey. At the bottom left are Mexican American pecan shellers in Texas. And at the bottom right are Native American fishermen in Oregon. Lee also recorded the discrimination and segregation of multiple ethnic and racial groups. For example, he documented the forcible evacuation and internment of Japanese Americans from the Pacific Coast in 1942. And on the left, I'm showing you one of his photographs from that series of a Japanese American child standing between two armed military police officers at the Santa Anita racetrack near Los Angeles. Lee was also sensitive to African American concerns and he repeatedly photographed the country's racial divide. On the right, I'm showing you Lee's portrait of a young black man drinking at a segregated water cooler in Oklahoma City in 1939. Lee later wrote that documenting the injustice of segregation was one of his personal objectives as an FSA photographer. And sadly, many of the social problems Lee documented are still with us, and his photographs continue to be relevant. For example, last summer, Stephen Colbert featured Lee's photograph of the man at the segregated water cooler in his late show monologue on racial injustice. Lee strived to create a comprehensive visual record of America. He excelled at documenting the small town, and he made hundreds of pictures of small town life across the country, such as this view of a secondhand tire shop in San Marcos, Texas. Lee also understood the details of American life the visual elements that Stryker was looking for in his photographic inventory of the country. And Lee later credited Stryker with helping him to recognize the importance of documenting the everyday. Stryker worked with Lee and the other photographers to write shooting scripts that included these details of American life, architecture, ephemera, activities, and objects that he wanted to record, like the barber pole. And here I'm showing you a sampling of Lee's barber pole photographs taken across the United States from Louisiana to Montana. Another detail Lee enjoyed documenting was the store window, which he called a window to the community. Lee made dozens of store window photographs across America. And for Lee, they were really as much about the proprietors who made them and the customers who saw them as they were about the windows themselves. And here I'm just showing you, I'm showing you just two examples, two very different windows that reflect the socioeconomic circumstances of each community. On the left is a store window in Muskegee, Oklahoma. And I'd like you to notice the peeling paint on the storefront, the rumpled and worn jackets and ties, and the handwritten sign announcing used clothing, shoes for sale, why pay more? Now compare that with the more prosperous window display on the right, taken at a beauty salon in Washington, DC, where clients could get electrolysis and a variety of colognes, a shampoo and a finger wave for $1.25, and wrap it all, the aristocrat hair coloring rinse. Lee's photographs show us his keen interest in the details of American life, how people lived. His photographs are really still lifes of society, vignettes of ordinary, everyday objects, like winter clothing hanging next to a telephone in an Iowa farmhouse, or tools of the lumber trade in a logging foreman's quarters in a Wisconsin lumber camp. In all, Lee shot 23,000 photographs across 29 states. 
in October 1942, he decided he wanted to contribute to the war effort through active military service. So he left Stryker's project to join the Air Transport Command. After the war, he went on to other photographic projects, but he always regarded his FSA years as one of the most important periods of his life, and he said it was the best job he ever had. He later recalled that when people approached him in the field and asked why he was photographing a particular scene, like this view of Main Street in Spencer, Iowa, Lee told them he was taking pictures of the history of today. And with that goal in mind, Lee created a poignant and lasting visual record of the Great Depression and mobilization for World War II. His photographs show us not only how America looked, but how Lee looked at America. Thank you so much for coming today. And as Laura mentioned, we have time for questions. So please feel free um, to put them in the chat and I'll see if I can figure out how to answer them. So. Okay. All right. Okay, I have the chat up. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy. Happy to answer. Okay, Patrick Ladden. Hey, Patrick. Um, where will all of your documentation, such as calendar and mapping, et cetera, be stored or donated? Is there a repository that will hold your research on Lee? Patrick, that is an excellent question. I'm not done with it yet. Um, I'm still using it for my next project, uh, my dissertation actually. And after that, I'm not really sure. I have, I have a place in mind, um, but I'm not quite ready to give it up yet. Lisa, uh, how does Lee's range of photography subjects compare to that of other FSA photographers? Well, that's also an excellent question. Um, Lee is the only, Lee had the longest tenure. He documented the full arc of the FSA activities. So, there is no other photographer who photographed the full range of, of um, all of the R RA, the FSA, and then the OWI, and then some others in between, Foreign Information Service, a few other um, agencies that this bounced through. So there, he has the largest range. Um, I think, and it, it may be because I've worked with his photographs so long, I can always tell a Russell Lee photograph. Um, it, it just it just has a certain sense to it. Um, and it, how do I say this? Um, Lee's photo. Lee never. One of the interesting things about Lee is he never intended his photographs to be seen singly, like I'm showing you. But that's really the only way to get across. Um, what Lee was doing, what Lee envisioned was that you would look at the photographs in context. So the photographs, all the photographs I'm showing you, like all of those people working in the factory, at the cotton gin, those, each one of those were part of a series. And Lee was telling a story with each of those. He never intended them, the photographs, to necessarily stand on their own. And one of my favorite quotes is from Ramana Javits at the New York Public Library. She said, um, Lee's photographs, every Lee photograph is like one word in a sentence. And I think she, she just really hit the nail on the head there with that. I don't know if that answers your question. A lot of photographers, the FSA photographers, um, they all had their own working methods, very different. Uh, okay, 
Great. Thank you. I answered it. <laughs> that was a very long-winded. Kit, <laughs> great presentation. I learned so much. Did Lee have a predominant mode of travel? I'm guessing a car. And did he send his undeveloped film back to Washington? Or could he see his work as he went? That is an excellent question. Lee had, he traveled mostly by car. Um, if he had to get, there were very few cases if he had to get someplace quickly. He did fly, but usually on another, um, someone else's dime, never on Stryker's dime. Um, and the photographers in the beginning processed their film in the field. That changed in about 1938 when Lee got a bad batch of potassium alum when he was in photographing Southeast Missouri farms and it ruined a lot of the negatives. So if you look at some of his work from Southeast Missouri farms and they look very blotchy, some of them are washed out, some of them the negatives are missing, um, they, st they, they changed it and started to send undeveloped film into Washington and then they would get prints back. But in the beginning, 1936, 1937, Lee would, would develop them. He would make a space light tight, a bathroom of a hotel, what have you. And then he would look, he said that he would look at the film with a magnifying glass to see, are the people's eyes open? You know, does it really, did he really achieve what he wanted with the photographs? So it changed in 1938. Patrick, will there be an exhibit of some of these photos based on the concept that each photo is like a word in a sentence? It might be very powerful. Uh, that's a good question too. Patrick is full of good questions. That is an excellent question as well. I don't have one planned because I'm, I've, I'm working on my dissertation now, but that's an excellent suggestion because you really do need to see Lee's photographs in context. Karen, thank you so much for talking to us tonight. Your book is wonderful. Can you talk a little more about his working relationship with Stryker? It sounds as if he had a great camaraderie and friendship with him. Was this uncommon with Stryker and the other photographers in the FSA? I sense that there were some disagreements in the staff. There were absolutely disagreements in the staff, and I think you're probably referring to Stryker's relationship with Dorothea Lang and with Walker Evans. Um, he respected them, but he th there were some very well documented disagreements with those two photographers. Um, Stryker at one point, he's later uh, in the 1970s, early 1970s, he said the one photographer stood out from all the rest and that was Russell Lee. He just, he helped him, he just felt that Russell Lee um, just helped him through a very difficult time doing this FSA um, project. It was not easy for Stryker. He was, it was a constant battle for money. Um, and he just, he just clicked with him. And one of the uh, photographers of that era, Louise Roscom, who worked with both uh, Stryker and Lee, told me that Stryker had just a really special relationship with Russell Lee that he didn't have with any other photographer. So um, I hope that answers your question. Um, Kit, interesting. Thank you for the information about the film. I also love that word in the sentence description. Yes, Ramana Javits was amazing. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? We'll wait uh, a few seconds here to see if any other questions come through the chat box. But okay. I do want to thank you so much for this amazing presentation this evening, Mary Jane. 
And if you're interested or know others who are interested in tonight's presentation who were unable to make it live, please look for the recording to be uploaded to the Reddick Library's YouTube channel. Oh, another question oh. came through here. Oh. <laughs> My friend Elena, whose photograph you saw in Pie Town. <laughs> Uh, did Roy Stryker poke holes and edit Russell Lee's negatives? Yes, he did. He did it to all of them uh, in the 35, with the 35 millimeter film in the early years. That um, process stopped around 19... I want to say 19, end of 1937, beginning of 1938. They were usually, though not always, uh, duplicates. They were things that Stryker was, uh, did not want to um, print. And it's, it was a controversy at that time. A lot of the photographers were very angry that he did that. And so he, um, he stopped doing it. They called that killing a negative, like literally killing the negative. So they still used the um, descriptor killed, but they stopped um, with the holes. And the thing that I want to mention that never gets the attention, because you can actually see the evidence of the 35 millimeter with the hole punch in them. You can see them on the Library of Congress website. Um, that's with the 35 millimeter. With the sheet film, Stryker just threw it away. So we have no evidence of that. And I did a, a tally of Russell Lee's first, I'm going to say first four months on the job. And Stryker threw out 20% of his sheet film, which I found appalling. And it, but that never gets the attention. I, I can only guess that he. I only did the statistics for, for Russell Lee's work. I can only guess that he did the same with the other photographers. So, oh, another question. I love the front cover, cover image too, but can you tell us why you chose it? Maybe his love of graphic design like images, his work truly blurs the documentary fine art divide. That is an excellent question. Um, this was really a... Uh, a choice of the publisher. Uh, Norton chose that image, the, the book designer, but I wholeheartedly agreed with it. Um, one of Stryker's uh, students from Austin, Texas, uh, excuse me, one of Lee's students from Austin, Texas, told me after he saw the cover of the book <clears throat> that that was one of Russell Lee's favorite photographs. So it was really a, a um, quite a nice, uh, quite a nice selection on multiple levels. And I wrote a blog post about that. I don't know if if you all know about it. If you go to the Library of Congress um, Prints and Photographs Division website, the picture of this blog, and I talk about that uh, photograph. i Mar in March of 2021. You should be able to find it. So that's a good question. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you again so much, Mary Jane. And oh, please, it was my pleasure. And please look for Russell Lee, A Photographer's Life and Legacy. It is an incredible, beautiful book. And I am very honored to have it in the Reddick Library Public Collection, our circulating collection. So I, again, thank you so much. And hopefully we will look forward to hosting you in person in the near future. So please look for that if you're interested as well. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for coming. Great. Have a good night, everyone.